This is the third of the evolution and speciation videos and this one is going to focus on speciation in particular in particular looking at um, two, two forms of speciation so sympatric speciation and allopatric speciation. Once again it is just a revision tool it is just a way of bringing some ideas together um, and it will not be enough in itself to provide you with an in-depth understanding. So a species can be defined as a group of individuals that can interbreed producing fertile offspring. So there's a couple of important things in there. The first thing is that they are able to interbreed and we're going to look at why that becomes an important feature in defining species being separate from each other. And the fertile offspring is also an important factor too. Okay, So um, there's two different types of species that we're going to look at. The first is allopatric species. So allo referring to other patric country. Basically, these are species that are geographically separated from each other. And sympatric species are species sim, the same patric country, so within the same area. Both of these species can be considered to be similar to each other because they come from a common point of origin, but now they are separate species but still similar. So if you talk about allopatric species... It is species that are like each other, that have a common origin, but are in different areas. Sympatric species will be species that are similar to each other, also have a common point of origin, but now they are um, they're separate species within the same kind of area. Okay. On the next slide, we'll look at how these um, processes take place to generate these species in both um, an allopatric manner and a sympatric manner. Firstly, let's look at how we actually maintain a species. So in order to maintain the separation, that means that we need to be able to prevent individuals interbreeding and or we need to prevent individuals being able to produce fertile offspring if they are of different species. Because if they are interbreeding and they are producing fertile offspring, then they are no longer a different species. They are technically the same species. So that's why these types of barriers become an important defining feature in whether something is a different species or not. So the first factors we'll look at are the prezygotic barriers. So these are barriers that are going to prevent individuals from different species of being able to breed with each other before a zygote is formed, so before the gametes fuse. Um, they are listed here. Very quickly I will run through those, but as I said previously, you'll need to look at these in more detail. So temporal isolation. What that can mean is that the, um, the two different species are active at different times of the day or night. So for example, a bird that is active at daytime is not likely to breed with a bird that is active in the nighttime, um, simply because you are not able to, for those birds to sort of meet each other during the same period of time. The second one is a geographical barrier. So this could be something like um, a mountain range has reasonably rapidly arisen or a lake is now separating two species from each other or a river is separating two species from each other or there is a very dense forest through which um, these individuals cannot pass. Just something that is some kind of physical separation that will keep these individuals from these two species from being able to breed with each other. Behavioural is the next one and this is where either the courting rituals or um, something to do with the behavior of that, of that animal means that the, the individuals of either species do not recognize them as being an appropriate mate. So what that means is that there is some kind of behavioral aspect going on that will prevent mating from occurring. Gamete incom incompatibility. So this is um, more on like a protein level. So it could be that the sperm, when it is fertilizing the egg, those proteins are just not, um, they're not appropriate for each other. And so that means that there won't be the right chemical signal sent when the sperm is fertilizing the egg and the zygote will not form because of this incompatibility on a chemical or molecular level. Structural barriers. So this could be to do with um, sort of actual physical um, 
physical structure differences within the sex organs. So for example, it could be to do with size differences. If you think about the differences between um, different types of species, that they're just physically not going to be able to breed with each other. Um, if you think about um, damselflies and other insects, the, the structures are actually completely incompatible. So that's not, it's just not going to happen. And ecological so this is where the individuals of different species live in different habitats. So even if they are in a similar area, they're just not going to come into contact with the species that lives in a different habitat from them. Okay, So these are all pre-zygotic barriers. These are all ways of preventing a zygote from forming in the first place. The second type of barriers are called post-zygotic barriers. So these are barriers that um, are evident if mating should occur, if a zygote is actually formed. The first one is at the hybrid, which is the offspring of two separate um, species or individuals from different species. That hybrid is inviable, so it means that it, um, that offspring either doesn't make it to um, to full term during pregnancy, so it may die before it is born. Um, and this is actually could be you know resulting in miscarriage and things like that. Um, it could also be that if that individual or that or that sort of offspring is actually born, then it doesn't survive very long. Okay, just because these um, chromosome numbers could be different, or there's something there that means this is not a healthy, viable um, offspring. If the hybrid does manage to survive, then that means that um, this and the next postzygotic barrier means that it could be infertile. So that even if this um, particular offspring survives and is a healthy individual, it is not able to produce gametes, it is not able to reproduce itself. Classic example of this is the hybrid between a horse and a donkey producing a mule. And mules are infertile because they um, cannot produce gametes. The main reason for this is actually due to the um, fact that horses and donkeys have, have different chromosome numbers. And so in the mule, they'll have an uneven number of gametes. And so meiosis cannot occur correctly. The last one is hybrid breakdown. And this um, refers to the idea that if an individual is produced as a hybrid, and it happens to be fertile for that first generation, over subsequent generations, the fertility will be lost so that within a couple of generations, that hybrid will not be able to breed on its own and produce more offspring. Okay, so once again, just a summary, we've got these pre-zygotic barriers that prevent a zygote forming in the first place and post-zygotic barriers are barriers that prevent a zygote from being fertile for a long period of time um, and sort of being able to maintain um, its own kind of um, not species but own population as it were. The next thing we're going to look at on the next slide is the difference between allo allopatric species and sympatric species. So we're now going to look at the two different forms of speciation, the first one being allopatric speciation. So this is the idea that um, what can happen is that a population spreads out over a larger geographical area than it had originally inhabited and then I mean, and that could be um, due to things like competition and things like that, um, or taking up new niches that have become available. And then some kind of geographical barrier comes along. So in this case, um, a river has formed between these, these two particular locations, but it could also be a mountain range or uplifting of a mountain range. Um, another classic example that will often come up at the end of the year is referencing the ice ages that have occurred within New Zealand. So this is the rise and fall of the, the water levels around both the North Island and South Island and either separating the North and South Islands from each other or joining them together. Um, remembering too that there are many outlying offshore islands that um, the ice ages have contributed to the population of. Um, and this is another thing that can happen a lot with the birds as well is that birds can fly out to offshore islands and therefore sort of generate this water as being a geographical barrier. So generally speaking, allopatric speciation is um, the type of speci speciation that occurs when a geographical barrier is in place, and then the particular conditions in those two different locations have put slightly different pressures on those populations. And so for example here, you can see that the trees are coloured slightly differently, and that's really just to show that on this side of the river, there was slightly different 
pressures being put on those individuals as compared to the original population. And so it means that these two populations um, of these trees will start evolving in different directions and then eventually they will become so different from each other that they can no longer interbreed and hence they will be a um, different species from each other. So similar species, same origin, but different country as it were or different location, hence allopatric speciation. The example of this um, in New Zealand, or an example of this, um, is in the New Zealand kakariki, the um, parakeets that are found in many offshore islands, and they all come from a, from a similar origin, but because they are located on different islands, as well as being on the on the main mainland as well, they have had slightly different um, evolutionary pressures or selective pressures put onto them, and so they have evolved into different species. Now, technically. We call them different species, but because they are very isolated on these offshore islands, we don't actually know if they could interbreed with each other if we were to sort of locate them back together. So technically they could actually be a subspecies, but we actually refer to them as being different species. So that's like the red-crowned parakeet and the yellow-crowned parakeet. Allopatric speciation generally it tends to be the most common type of speciation involving animals. Okay, Right, sympatric speciation. So that's the second um, type we're going to look at. Sim being same, patric country. So generally speaking, sympatric speciation is the speciation um, of populations within the same area or within areas that individuals could potentially interbreed with each other. So in this case, we've got our trees. Um, there is no geographical barrier here, but you can see there is a little group of trees within the center of the other ones that have, are now looking ever so slightly different. Okay, Generally speaking, a lot of sympatric speciation occurs through polyploidy. And so obviously this is gen uh, uh, the vast majority of polyploidy occurs in plants. And so sympatric speciation does tend to be more common um, in plants, especially looking at the effects of polyploidy. Remembering that polyploidy is the doubling of an entire set of chromosomes. So for example, going from a, um, a chromosome number of 30, 32 up to a chromosome number of 64, for example. Okay. Um, the other factor that can contribute to sympatric speciation is niche, niche specialization. So, for example, if, um, not shown on this image here, but if a population expanded into new niches, and so, for example, took up eating a different type of food or being active at a different time of the day, so they became nocturnal instead of diurnal, then that could also contribute to a different, pop, a different species evolving, even though it was in the same geographical area. Okay, um, An example of... Sympatric speciation in New Zealand is the Malachitis shrub, and this has occurred through polyploidy, so it is actually um, originally probably um, doubled up its chromosome number to become um, triploid, and then once it was triploid, it probably underwent amphipolyploidy to stabilize its chromosome number and allow it to become fertile, and then it had ended up with a tetraploid, so basically four copies of those of those sets of chromosomes. So going from a chromosome number of 32 up to 64. So just to recap, allopatric speciation, similar species, different geographical location because of some kind of geographical barrier that is there. This is where the ice ages often tie into this. Sympatric speciation, same area. Generally speaking, this involves niche specialization or polyploidy. Okay, um, so that's it for the speciation summary. The next one is going to look at patterns of evolution.